Our parish churches have been at the centre of town and village life in Cornwall since the first wooden churches were built on former pagan sites of worship. These buildings, their art and their architecture have been shaped by local events and history, providing us today with an insight into the lives of our forebears and the panoply of British history. According to tradition, the Cornish Saint Brieca, the sister of Saint Levin, founded the church on this site to the southeast of Dragoning Hill in the 6th century. The building we see today in the village of Brieg, which took the saint's name, replaced an earlier Norman church and was dedicated to the saint on the 26th of December 1456. It had taken six years to build and is a typical Cornish church built entirely of granite and is very much as the 15th century builders left it. The tower is 66 feet in height and can be seen for miles over the surrounding countryside and is used by mariners at sea as an aid to navigation. The weathered jams of the south porch, worn through the centuries by hands of countless parishioners, vividly illustrates the passing of time. Inside, despite the extensive Victorian restoration of 1891, the church retains its original cruciform floor plan and distinctive Cornish barrel-shaped roof. But as soon as you enter the nave, there's one dominant feature which arrests the visitor, the medieval wall paintings. The frescoes with which the whole of the interior walls were once covered were painted shortly after the building of the church in the latter half of the 15th century. The figure of St Christopher, bearing the infant Christ upon his shoulder, faces the south door. The saint, according to medieval tradition, was a harbinger of good luck, and to see his image on entering a church gave protection against evil and sudden unshriven death without the administration of the final sacraments. This may partly account for the superstition that to enter the church by the west door, which was rarely used save for the bearing out of dead at funerals, instilled bad luck and foreshadowed untimely death. On the adjacent wall, and equally striking, is the large figure of Christ, crowned with thorns and displaying the five wounds, surrounded by the tools and implements of trade, of farming and village life. This monumental picture dates from about 1470 and is the best preserved of several other examples we found around the country. It was the subject of much learned speculation until its antecedent was discovered in a church near Florence with an inscription that reads in translation, Whosoever doth not keep holy the Sabbath day and have devotion to Christ, God will consign him to everlasting damnation. Who it was who painted these pictures is a matter for conjecture. The records, if they ever existed, have long since disappeared. Some think it was a group of travelling monks who went from church to church. Others, that it was local artists appointed and funded by the landed gentry. But one thing we do know is the methods that the artists employed. The walls of medieval buildings were almost always plastered. Rather than the true fresco method used on the continent of painting directly onto fresh, wet plaster, in Britain the mortar was first allowed to set before a coat of lime wash was applied to form a smooth base for painting. Compared with fresco, the lime water method allowed greater freedom in the timing of operations. The scale of wall paintings demanded simple, inexpensive pigments, and Cornwall is rich in the minerals, the rocks and ores used to produce the ochres and hues that were the wall painters' staple pigments. These earth colours were cheap, easily ground and permanent, and when mixed with the white of lime putty and modified with charcoal black, prepared from toasted nutshells, provided a wide palette of tones. That these murals survived the Reformation is nothing short of miraculous. In April 1549, commissioners were sent by parliamentary authorities throughout the land to examine every church and to have all the images found in them removed and destroyed, and to plunder the churches of their valuable plate, jewels and vestments. The commissioners were also required to ascertain that the services were no longer held in Latin, but in the English tongue. The Cornish, like the Welsh, were bitterly opposed to the Reformations and in all works and ways would have none of it. On Sunday, 9th of June, 1549, the new service in English was used for the first time in place of Mass. 
in compliance with the royal injunctions. But in towns and villages across Devon and Cornwall, the congregation compelled their parish priests to resume their vestments and to say mass as usual. In Helston, a commissioner named William Boddy was making his official examination when he was dragged into the street and stabbed to death by an enraged priest. This spark set the duchy already smouldering with discontent into a blaze of rebellion. The people under the influence of the clergy and the Catholic gentry flocked together and the rapidly growing rabble began to march on Exeter. By the time Bodmin was reached, the rebellion had grown to 6,000 strong. At the end of June, the Cornishmen had met with Devonian rebels and together they closed in on Exeter, only to find the city's gates barred to them. The siege lasted nearly a month until the rebels, outmaneuvered and surrounded by government troops and foreign mercenaries, were slaughtered. A number of priests were hanged, including John Payne, Portreeve of St Ives, while the rebel leaders were taken to London to be hung, drawn and quartered at Tyburn. It is estimated that more than 5,500 people lost their lives in the Prayer Book Rebellion. Approximately 10% of the Duchy's entire population, including 900 unarmed Cornish prisoners who in the space of 10 minutes all had their throats cut. From thereafter, the flag of St George became known across the Duchy as the Butcher's Apron. Following the Reformation, church murals were painted over, obliterated and forgotten. During the 19th century, in the Victorian restoration of churches across the British Isles, the practice of removing lime plaster, chipping it from the walls to reveal the stone beneath, became widespread, and countless wall paintings were destroyed. There are, without doubt, many paintings still waiting to be discovered, hidden beneath the old lime wash. But the curious thing I discovered when researching for this film is that each church is responsible for its own paintings, their upkeep, protection and their preservation. There's no central body with a budget to conserve these precious works of art, many of which are more than 600 years old and are an important part of our heritage.